The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Facing the Challenges of EOE Head-On, a game plan for diagnosis and integrating targeted therapy using a team approach. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash UKS860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, this is Dr. Dan Atkins from the Gastrointestinal Eosinophilic Diseases Program at Children's Hospital Colorado in Denver. Thanks for participating in this educational activity entitled Facing the Challenges of Eosinophilic Esophagitis Head-On, a Game Plan for Diagnosis and Integrating Targeted Therapy Using a Team Approach. This activity begins with an interactive game to assess and improve your knowledge about EOE. After that, I'll review the signs, symptoms, and approach to diagnosing EOE, the challenges associated with the current treatment approaches, and discuss practical strategies for using targeted therapy to treat EOE. Our learning objectives today are as follows. Number one, recognize the signs and symptoms of EOE in children and adults and how to use the latest criteria in collaboration with other members of a multidisciplinary healthcare team to make an accurate diagnosis and develop a treatment plan. Number two, Explain the limitations associated with the current standard of care for EOE. And number three, discuss when and how to integrate targeted biologic therapy into treatment plans for appropriate patients with EOE using the latest clinical evidence in the context of shared decision-making. Eosinophilic esophagitis is a chronic, immune antigen-mediated esophageal disease characterized clinically by symptoms related to esophageal dysfunction and histologically by eosinophil predominant inflammation. The prevalence of EOE is increasing, but diagnostic delays are common, and signs and symptoms vary between children and adults. Standard treatment approaches can have limited efficacy, and obtaining long-term adherence can be difficult. Fortunately, a few targeted biologic agents that address the underlying mechanisms of EOE are now available and in development. With this in mind, let's begin the game portion of the activity and assess your EOE knowledge base. You will be presented with questions or scenarios and will be able to earn up to 1,400 points. You will see your points in ranking among your colleagues as you proceed through the game. EOE signs and symptoms vary by age. In infants and children, they often present with reflux-like symptoms, nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, food refusal, and failure to thrive. Whereas in adolescents and adults, they tend to present more often with reflux-like symptoms, heartburn and regurgitation, dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, food impaction with food stuck in their throat, or chest pain. Let's take a quick look right now at a patient who will briefly discuss what our early symptoms of EOE were like. Most prominent symptom I had was just food slowing down or getting stuck. And I didn't really notice anything prior to that. So I would be like chicken I would eat and it would just slow down. And then when it would get stuck, I'd have to go through the whole process of trying to get it out. And I had never gone to the ER for that. It was more so a solo process of trying to put water down and push it down. And if that didn't work, eventually my body would react and I'd end up vomiting and that would push it out. But that was the most prominent symptom was slowing of food or things getting stuck. I was done living like that. I knew like I have to go to a doctor. This is this is annoying. I, I can't live like this anymore. It, it was so relieving to hear somebody who knew what they were talking about. Like it wasn't all in my head this whole time. They knew what EOE was. They knew what was going on. And they basically said, yeah, you have to get an endoscopy with a biopsy. Well, it was one of the most terrifying things I've ever done. It was also one of the best things I've ever done because I got to finally see what was going on in there and how messed up my esophagus was and officially confirm that yes, I have EOE. So patients with EOE develop certain adaptive behaviors that they may not recognize as abnormal. And you can remember them using the mnemonic impact. So the typical patient with eosinophilic esophagitis cuts a small bite, puts sauces on it, chews it for a long time, and when they start to swallow it, they take a sip of liquid to help them swallow it, and they avoid meats and breads and more dense foods. You should ask patients about whether they exhibit these adaptive behaviors to dysphagia that they may not recognize as abnormal and therefore may not report them to you unless you ask specifically about them. 
Most patients with eosinophilic esophagitis have comorbid atopic conditions. We just learned that about 78% of patients with EOE report at least one comorbid atopic condition, and 48% report having more than one, and 22% report having three or more. So you can see from this graph, looking at children in the dark blue, adolescents in the lighter blue, and adults in the orange, that about 60% of patients have allergic rhinitis, about 50% or so of children and adolescents have asthma, about 60% of children have atopic dermatitis with lesser amounts as they get older to about 30%, and 76% of children have food allergies, 63% of adolescents, and 54% of adults report food allergy. So a history of food allergy or atopic dermatitis is associated with a significantly shorter time between symptom onset and diagnosis, primarily because they're seeing allergists for the treatment of this condition, and it draws the attention of the allergist to their dysphagia and potential eosinophilic esophagitis. So patients presenting with these conditions should always be asked if they're having difficulty swallowing or exhibiting any of the other adaptive behaviors for eosinophilic esophagitis. An early diagnosis is important because uncontrolled eosinophilic esophagitis can lead to esophageal stricture. Of patients with diagnostic delay, 57% had food impactions and 52% had a stricture in one study. Feeding dysfunction is also common, and this is especially relevant for children. Anywhere from 15 to 60% of patients with EOE have feeding dysfunction, and about 21% of children with EOE and feeding disorders also have associated failure to thrive. In addition, EOE has a significant impact on the quality of life. So what's the importance of a multidisciplinary approach to the management of eosinophilic esophagitis? Well, there are a number of features that support a multidisciplinary approach. It's a heterogeneous disease. There's multi-system involvement. You have a frequent co-occurrence of atopic conditions, as we just discussed, and they need a variety of assessments and treatment approaches in order to treat them appropriately. So you need an allergist, immunologist, a gastroenterologist. You need a pathologist to read the slides. They need a dietitian to help with dietary therapies and make sure their diet is adequate. A number of them will need a feeding therapist, particularly the children, because they're avoiding certain foods and may not develop appropriate eating behaviors. And nurse practitioners and physician assistants are helpful to help explain and follow these patients carefully. And you need a primary care physician that you can work with because of their other issues as well. So what's the role of the allergist and the specially advanced practice provider in eosinophilic esophagitis? Well, it includes the assessment, evaluation, and management of concurrent atopic disease and avoiding triggering antigens identified by history and testing, such as environmental allergens or food allergens, referral to a gastroenterologist for confirmation of EOE diagnosis, and to establish a collaborative approach to treatment. And allergists may play an increasing role in management as less invasive, non-endoscopic methods for evaluating esophageal eosinophilic inflammation become more widely available. And this will be particularly helpful with the reintroduction of foods into the diet where you may not need to have an endoscopy after each food addition. You might be able to use other methods that are less invasive. So this is the updated EOE diagnostic algorithm from the AGREE conference. The patient presents with symptoms suggestive of eosinophilic esophagitis, esophageal dysfunction type symptoms. They get an EGD with biopsy. They're found to have esophageal eosinophilia with more than or equal to 15 eosinophils per half power field, which is about 60 eosinophils per millimeter squared. And then you rule out non-EOE disorders that can potentially cause or contribute to esophageal eosinophilia and if you've ruled them all out and the other features are present, you can make the diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis. So let's go back to the patient we saw earlier and listen to her briefly talk about how she felt when she received a formal diagnosis and how EOE affects her life. It's still been a struggle, and I think a lot of it's just kind of learning about what triggers my esophagus and what doesn't. Um, and that's kind of been a trial and error thing. I'm hoping that I can talk to more doctors about that to get more clarity. Um, Cause I know there's a lot of allergy crossover with EOE. Um, so right now it's not great, but at least when I find a food that doesn't trigger it, um, it's easy to eat and I don't have to worry about it getting stuck, which is a really big change. So it's kind of a trade off. Um, I'm hoping to gain more control, but 
I, I guess I've just gotten used to it. I've definitely adapted to it. Um, I get very stuck in eating the same thing every day because I know it works. Now let's turn our attention to the next part of our program, challenges associated with current treatment approaches. So we treat patients to target different areas, such as symptom activity, histologic activity, and endoscopic activity. And we want to know if they're having a complete response or they're not responding or what level of the response they have. And we do that by asking about symptoms of dysphagia, about their need to avoid foods based on texture. For example, do they eat steak or do they avoid steak or meats? We check histologic activity by examining the number of eosinophils per high power field and the peak number of eosinophils per high power field. We also look for other features of eosinophilic esophagitis. And then we use endoscopy to look for certain inflammatory features when we examine the esophagus with endoscope. And particularly, we're looking for strictures and exudates and rings and furrows and aditi. So the suggested approach to management is as follows. You make the diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis because they present with esophageal eosinophilia of greater than or equal to 15 eosinophil per high power field. You can rule out the other potential diagnoses. So then you've diagnosed them with eosinophilic esophagitis. You discuss with them the various options that are available for treatment and then make a decision based upon their interests and what they would like to do after listening to you present the different forms of therapy. So PPI twice daily is generally favored as the initial approach because of its cost and safety profile. About 30 to 50% of patients are PPI responsive, so there are a number who will not respond, but there are some who will. Then the next steps include a food elimination diet, and given the cost and safety profile, we favor the fourth food elimination diet in appropriately motivated patients. But again, you may decide on another elimination diet based on your discussion with the patient and what they're willing to do. Swallowed topical steroids are also used frequently in this situation, such as fluticasone, 220 micrograms, four puffs swallowed twice daily in adults. The dose is obviously lower in children. Or budesonide, a one milligram slurry, where you take the budesonide and add five packets of Splenda or honey or neocate neutra or some other ingredient to thicken the consistency so that it'll adhere to the esophagus more as it's being swallowed. And then next would be a biologic such as dupilumab, which has been FDA approved since May of 2022. And the dose is dupilumab 300 milligrams sub Q weekly. So let's talk about elimination diets. What do you eliminate? Well, the common diets that are used are the six food elimination diets, which includes milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. The four food elimination diet, which is used more often than the six food elimination diet now, including milk, wheat, egg, and soy. The two food, which is milk and wheat, or the one food, which is milk. And you may find some patients that say, look, I don't want to eliminate six foods, but I want to see if milk, which is one of the most common triggers, is the cause. And they may decide with a milk elimination diet. What about proton pump inhibitors? Well, the AGA JTF guidelines suggest that PPI should be used over no treatment. The histologic response rate is about 42%. They have both anti secretory and anti inflammatory activities, so it's not just acid suppression, there's also an anti inflammatory activity. And it's the primary therapeutic option because of its long standing safety profile, the ease of administration, and the low cost. And you start with twice daily dosing. The role of the PPI in therapy has changed over time. Initially, it was required that you put a patient on twice daily PPI in order to make the diagnosis. So they had to be on twice daily PPI for six weeks after you thought they might have it, and then you got your endoscopy. And if they still had equal to or more than 15 eosinophils per high power field, you could make the diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis because at the time we had something that was called PPI responsive esophageal eosinophilia. But over time, it was realized that that's really eosinophilic esophagitis, so now it's a primary therapy for eosinophilic esophagitis, and the PPI trial is not indicated. In regard to topical swallowed corticosteroids, the AGA JTF guidelines suggest that topical corticosteroids should be used over no treatment, strong recommendation. There are currently no formulations approved by the FDA for EOE treatment. Histologic remission of less than 15 eosinophils per high power field occurs in about 65% of the patients who choose this route of therapy. It provides topical contact with the esophageal mucosa to reduce eosinophilic inflammation. So you're swallowing the topical steroid. You don't eat or drink for 30 minutes afterwards to give plenty of time for the steroid to interact with the esophageal mucosa and be absorbed and start to have its action. It has a safer and similar efficacy 
to systemic or oral corticosteroids, but as I mentioned again, it's much safer. And adverse events are rare. I really thought most people were going to develop esophageal candidiasis, but this is really rare, occurring in only 1% to 3%, very low. There are multiple advantages and disadvantages in the different approaches. Proton pump inhibitor is given once to twice daily, but you start with twice daily, relatively low cost. Side effects are few, but can include headache, diarrhea, increased risk of enteric infections. The profile of side effects is low. It's low cost and well tolerated, which is why you might recommend it. And it's, like we said, successful in 48%. And the cons are that they have to take a medicine daily, once to twice a day, and there's only a 30 to 50% response rate. In regard to the swallowed topical corticosteroids, you take them twice daily. The cost is a little more than proton pump inhibitor. You can develop candida esophagitis. You can have voice changes and a sore throat, but the side effect profile is low to moderate, and they're very effective, and you don't need to take foods out of your diet. The cons are it's a twice daily medication and is not designed for esophageal specific delivery, and it can be expensive for some patients. And then there's a food elimination diet. It requires constant elimination of the food with rare instances where you might ingest the food. Rare, rare. The cost is a bit more than your usual diet. The side effects are food cravings. You always want what you can't have, and you have to watch for nutritional deficiencies. The side effect profile is very low. The benefits are it's a natural treatment. You're not using medications. There's generally a low cost overall, although alternative foods are more expensive than usual foods. And the disadvantages are it requires constant elimination and typically requires four to six endoscopies to identify the trigger with accompanying cost. So you're going to need several endoscopies to figure out your diet and which foods need to be eliminated. So let's take a look at the factors that play a role in the pathophysiology of eosinophilic esophagitis. We know that there are genetic issues, gender plays a role, there's a heritability issue, atopy plays a role, environmental exposures play a role, and there's cellular pathology that's involved. As we discussed previously, it's a Th2-mediated condition that's recognized by the infiltration of eosinophils into the esophagus, but it's really activated by Th2 lymphocytes that increase tissue levels of Th2 cytokines, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13, and this results in chronic esophageal inflammation and dysfunction. So what happens is they have a permeable esophageal mucosa. The food antigen, primarily food antigens, penetrate further than they should, the immune system of the body recognizes it, and because it's a protein in the wrong place, thinks it might be, for example, a parasite, and mounts an allergic response. So the epithelial cells secrete mediators such as IL-33, TSLP, and 5Q22, which impacts Th2 lymphocytes to produce the cytokines we mentioned that then leads to other mediators being released that have the downstream effect of affecting the barrier so that it stays permeable and leading to esophageal inflammation to try to kill the parasite or whatever it is and clean it up. And then they have remodeling, which is where we get the fibrosis afterwards if it's long-term and they don't recover by removal of the antigen. Let's take a look here at the role of type 2 inflammation in EOE with this brief 3D animated clip. Eosinophilic esophagitis, or EOE, is primarily driven by underlying type 2 inflammation, characterized by immune dysregulation and epithelial barrier dysfunction. Mediators of type 2 inflammation include eosinophils, mast cells, Th2 cells that produce the cytokines IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13, ILC2s and IgE producing B cells. Th2 cells are a subpopulation of CD4 positive T cells, which secrete IL4, IL5, and IL13 and stimulate the type 2 response. IL4, IL13, and IL5 are key drivers of type 2 inflammation in EOE. IL-4 and IL-13 also contribute to the activation of mast cells and basophils, leading to the release of several inflammatory mediators. IL-4 and IL-13 drive epithelial barrier dysfunction, facilitating the entry of antigens that can worsen inflammation and increase access to allergens and pathogens across the epithelial barrier. They then propagate local inflammation, resulting in remodeling and fibrosis, such as furrows, distinct rings, edema, exudates, strictures, and increased smooth muscle contraction. 
IL-4, IL-13, and IL-5 also contribute to eosinophil activation and trafficking to tissues. IL-5 drives eosinophil differentiation in the bone marrow. Dupilumab is a fully human monoclonal antibody that binds to the shared alpha subunit of the IL-4 receptor and therefore inhibits IL-4 and IL-13 signaling. By inhibiting IL-4 and IL-13 signaling, type 2 inflammation is reduced, decreasing eosinophil count and improving symptoms of EOE, including difficulty swallowing, for patients. So why do we use biologics for EOE? Well, we use them when we have corticosteroid refractory patients or corticosteroid intolerance. We use them when we're using the concept of therapy targeting specific pathways of allergic disease. If we're using systemic treatment of multiple forms of atopy, as we've said, a number of patients with EOE have other atopic conditions, and so you can treat them all with the appropriate biologic. And they're the practical benefits of weekly rather than daily therapy if you're talking about eosinophilic esophagitis. For example, the use of dupilumab is a once-weekly injection. So you're not needing to give something daily or twice daily, which increases adherence. So let's talk about dupilumab. It's an anti-IL-4 alpha receptor blocker. It blocks the ability of IL-4 and IL-13 to bind to the receptor. So it inhibits signaling of both IL-4 and IL-13. And it's approved in the United States for the treatment of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis in children six months of age and older, moderate to severe asthma, six years and older, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, and paragonodularis in patients 18 years and older, and EOE in patients that are 12 years of age and older. And that was approved in May of 2022, and it's currently the only medication approved by the FDA for the treatment of eosinophilic esophagitis. So dupilumab reduces dysphagia symptoms and maintains histologic remission in EOE of both 24 and 52 weeks, and that was determined in the Liberty EOE TREAT trial. Weekly subcutaneous dupilumab was associated with improvements in both histology and symptoms among adults and adolescents with EOE, and about 60% of those treated with dupilumab achieved histologic remission versus only 6.3% in the placebo group. And the patients with dupilumab also experienced reduced dysphagia symptoms, about 10 points greater improvement on mean dysphagia symptom questionnaire scores versus the placebo group. The common adverse events occurring in more than 10% of the patients in any dupilumab arm were injection site reactions, had redness, pain, and swelling, or nasopharyngitis. Dupilumab has also been shown to improve histologic and endologic features of EOE in children aged 1 to 11 years in a phase 3 kids study, and that's illustrated on this particular slide. So the criteria for the consideration of the dupilumab for the treatment of eosinophilic esophagitis are as follows. It's considered for first-line use if the patient has multiple comorbid atopic conditions, asthma, atopic dermatitis, food allergy, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, or if there's a strong preference to avoid dietary restriction or swallowed topical corticosteroids. It's considered for use as a step-up therapy if they have difficult to treat EOE, failure to thrive or growth, or significant weight loss due to EOE, if they frequently need to use rescue therapies, if they have severe dietary restrictions or requirement for an amino acid-based formula, or if they have clinically significant esophageal stricture or a narrow caliber esophagus, if they're refractory to current therapies, or if they have adverse events from current therapies. There are other biologics that are being examined for treatment of EOE, such as syndecamab. It's an anti-IL-13 agent, and it's a recombinant humanized monoclonal IgG1 kappa antibody that's highly selective for IL-13 and inhibits the binding of IL-13 to the IL-13 receptor alpha-1 and IL-13 receptor alpha-2. It's administered as a weekly injection subcutaneously. There are also other emerging targeted agents for eosinophilic esophagitis, such as tezepelumab, which is an anti-TSLP that's been examined in adults and adolescents, and barzovolumab, which has been used in adults, and it's an anti-KET agent, and it's been used in a phase two trial called the Evolve trial. So in summary, eosinophilic esophagitis continues to increase in worldwide incidence and prevalence. The EOE diagnostic criteria have been updated so symptoms and eating behaviors are often different in children and adults, and the diagnosis involves appropriate symptoms in the setting of esophageal eosinophilia greater than or equal to 15 eosinophils per high power field that does not have another contributing cause. A PPI trial is no longer mandatory, as we mentioned previously. 
and a multidisciplinary approach in the diagnosis and management of EOE is essential. An early diagnosis, along with ongoing treatment, will likely reduce complications caused by EOE progression. Targeted biologic therapy, dupilumab, is now available for patients 12 years of age and older with EOE, and study results appear promising in children aged 1 to 11 years, and other biologic agents are in development. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I hope you found this program to be useful to your practice. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash UKS 860. This activity is supported by an independent medical education grant from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals Incorporated and Sanofi.